And all God's people said, Amen. man, it was good worship this morning. Thanks, guys. It's awesome. <laughs> after a song like that, my dad would say, if you can't preach after that, you can't preach. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Hey, if you have your Bibles, would you please open them up to Matthew chapter 11? I say it every week, but we are a Bible-leaving, Bible-teaching church. We're gonna be led by God through his word uh, until he comes back. That's who we are. Uh, and this morning, I, I would really encourage you to bring your Bibles uh, because I really do believe something, I can't explain it, special happens when you have your Bible in front of you and you're engaging with the Word uh, with me. If you don't, don't worry about it. Just use your phone, pull it out, Google Matthew chapter 11. We are looking at 19 unbelievably theologically packed verses. So I hope you brought your mind uh, this morning because we got some uh, theological work uh, to do that's absolutely beautiful, that sets us free doctrinally uh, to live as Christ has called us uh, to live. If you are new, uh, we're walking verse by verse by verse uh, as much as we possibly can through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but pretty much every week, I give you a little bit of why Matthew writes because like today, the passage comes alive. It makes so much more sense understanding Matthew's purpose behind it. Matthew is writing to his fellow countrymen to prove to them that Jesus is the Old Testament Messiah. It, it, he, he's going from looking at Genesis all the way through Malachi, all these unbelievable prophecies that are fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and he is showing us how it fits. It's a 28 chapter argument through the Old Testament, Israel's history, now Jesus in real time, looking at his teaching, ministry, miracles, that he is that guy. And I'll just straight up tell you, today has a lot of Old Testament scripture in it that Jesus not only is a part of fulfilling, but Jesus is quoting, he's claiming, He's saying this morning, I'm that guy. Now today's passage has two overarching points being taught. One is kind of intimately looking into the life of John the Baptist. The other one is the big overarching point that we're making over and over again as we look at the Old Testament prophecies fulfilled that Jesus is the Messiah. But we have an opportunity to look intimately uh, and then being able to empathize with John the Baptist's real life struggle. So far, what we've seen with John, if you've been traveling with us, is John is this incredibly bold, strong, courageous, godly, faithful, paver of the road for Jesus. And today's passage, we get to see through that tough exterior to his heart. That although he's still full of strong conviction, we see a bit of a faith crisis. He's struggling with doubt. He's struggling with who he thinks Jesus is. May be, and, and we're going to get into the why of the struggle in just a bit because I think we can all relate. Now, as I've been doing quite a bit lately, we're just going to walk verse by verse by verse through the passage and allow it to be our outline because today's passage, especially, just does not lean itself to a three point sermon with a conclusion. It's just, it takes us in many different directions. But I didn't write it, so talk to Matthew. <laughs> Uh, it's God's given word to us, and I just believe strongly that when we open it up and reread it and then we preach it, the promise from Scripture is it will not come back void. And so we're allowing God to uh, teach us. I, I claim hold of uh, the promise that Paul wrote in 2 Timothy that says the Holy Spirit will use this passage to teach, rebuke, correct, and train us for righteousness so that we as the people engage his word, we will be equipped to live as he's called us to live. Now, to set up the passage, we are in a bit of a mini-series. We're breaking up this 28-chapter argument into these bite-sized pieces so that we can get our arms around some of these co concepts. But this mini-series is the kingdom of God. We're specifically looking at Matthew 10, 11, and 12 that focus in on Jesus' teaching on his kingdom. And as we will see every week, but even specifically this week is highlighted, it's number one, an upside-down kingdom. Uh, the Bible says it's the servant amongst us that's the greatest. That's not like any other kingdom we've seen. In fact, in today's passage, Jesus says John is the greatest in the kingdom. And then it goes on to say, but the least in the kingdom are still even greater. That's a backwards, upside down kingdom. But it's all also an already here kingdom because the Bible teaches that when you give your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within our hearts. And so the kingdom today exists in the hearts of his believers. But it's also a not fully established kingdom because the Bible promises that one day he will come back and he will give us a new heaven and a new earth and his throne will be established. We will be given new bodies. It's then there will be no more heartache, hurt, or tears. Now as we dive in, coming off last week's passage, we looked at Jesus' words, what a true disciple of Christ looks like. So coming off that, remember there's no chapters and verses in the original writing. So coming right off that concept, we look at John, who's the greatest disciple in the kingdom. 
Another way to say it is you wanna know what a disciple of Jesus looks like? Well, let's look at John. And what's so poignant in the passage that I wanna really highlight is John is gonna be called the greatest in the kingdom, but what we see in this passage is John has flaws. John is the greatest, but he's not perfect. And I think we all can relate to that. Let's dive in, Matthew chapter 11, we're gonna look at the first three verses. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison, so that's where John is, in prison, what Jesus was doing, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? A lot to unpack here. So let's first start with who John is and why he is in prison. So who's John? Uh, there's a lot of Johns in our New Testament and sometimes it can get a bit confusing, so I wanna make sure we understand who we're talking about. John and Jesus, John the Baptist and Jesus uh, are related. Uh, we don't know exactly how because of the language that's kind of vague in Luke chapter two. Most scholars would argue that Mary and Elizabeth, who are Jesus and John's moms, were cousins. But even if that's not exactly what their relation was, what is important is that their moms are related and they both got together when they were pregnant. Mary with Jesus, Elizabeth with John. It's kind of like an ancient version of a modern day baby shower. But what happens in their connection is fascinating. First off, both John's and Jesus' births were miraculous. We have John's, which is miraculous because Elizabeth was barren her entire life. Now she's old and unable to have kids. And yet when her husband, Zechariah, a priest was in the temple, an angel comes and says, you're gonna give birth to a son. And what does John do? I mean, Zechariah do? He laughs. Are you kidding me? There's no possible way. We are way too old for that. So there's a prophecy that she's going to give birth, but it also says who that child will be. He will be great, for he is the forerunner to our savior in the name of Elijah. We'll get into a bit in that because it's super significant. It's what the Jewish people were awaiting. And of course, we know of Jesus' miraculous birth, born of a virgin, also prophesied. Now, they get together, and the baby inside of Elizabeth's womb, it tells us in Scripture, John jumps. We don't know exactly what that was like. But we're also told that the Holy Spirit comes on to Elizabeth, and she's given a revelation. The revelation is not now that she just knows who John is. She now knows who Jesus is. Luke 1 says this, Elizabeth speaking, how is it that the mother of my Lord will come to me? So do the math, put it together. Elizabeth has some serious inside information. She not only knows who her child is, the prophesied forerunner to the Messiah, she now knows who Jesus is. Now, it nowhere says this in scripture, but I'm guessing there's no doubt that at some point in time, uh, Elizabeth had a conversation with John. Hey, this is your call. And by the way, this is who your cousin is. Part of the reason why we think this is because John shows up declaring it to be true. The first thing that John does when he shows up proclaiming the message is that repent for the kingdom of heaven is here as scripture prophesied, meaning the Messiah has come. John knows who he is because he clearly says it. John says, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, directly quoting Isaiah chapter 40. He also says, as for me, I'm bapt I will baptize with water and repentance, but there's one who will come after me who I am not even fit to take off his sandals and clean his feet. He will come and he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then, of course, when John sees Jesus for the first time in front of everybody, he says, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the point of all of, of this is, if I've lost you in that incredibly important theological tirade, it's this. John clearly knows who he is. He's the Elijah prophesied to come, and he knows who Jesus is, for he declares it to all who come out to the Jordan to be baptized, and he is okay with his secondary role. For later, he says, it's my joy to be the forerunner, for I must decrease, and he must increase. The point is, John is awesome. John is the very definition of a disciple that we looked at in the last couple weeks. He's committed to God, for we can see he's committed to the word. He's committed to be a servant of Jesus. He's committed to Jesus as the Messiah. And we will see later in Matthew, he's willing to lay his life down for the gospel. Now that's who John is. Now why is he in prison? As we said last week, it's not easy following Jesus. And it's true for John because John ends up in prison simply because he takes a stand for God's standards. 
Here's what happens. At the time of Jesus, uh, there was a Roman ruler in the area, and his name was uh, Herod Antipas. To give you an idea who Herod Antipas was, he was one of four sons who took over Herod the Great's kingdom. They split it up into four quarters. I don't have time to really unpack Herod the Great, uh, other than to just remind you that Herod the Great was the one who was ruling when Jesus was born, to give you an idea of uh, just a terrible hate, you know, hater, murderous, uh, selfish kind of person he was. It's he who sent his men down to Bethlehem and killed hundreds of babies because he didn't want to share his throne with anybody, this guy, this Messiah, this possible Jesus down in Bethlehem. So Antipas, that's his dad. So being a Herod, part of that family, they took whatever they wanted, and if you got in the way, they just killed you. So when a Herod would come to you and say, hey, I want that, you would say, okay, here it is. Because if you held on to it, it simply meant that you were going to die. And so Herod looks at his brother's wife, Philip, and he says, I want her. And because Herod was the bigger kid on the block, if you will, he gets his brother's wife. And so it's because of this that then John steps into his life and confronts him. And so you have this crazy camel hair wearing locust and honey eaten prophet come to Antipas in public, a Herod known for his murderous ways, and John says to him, what you have done with your brother's wife is unlawful before God. This guy calls out the most selfish, ruthless, murderous, powerful man in his area at the time and says, you're in sin, my brother. And the scriptures tell us it's in that moment Antipas wants to kill John. That's what it says. But he doesn't. Why? Because the crowd, if you've ever watched the movie Gladiator, the mob they're afraid of what the people will do. At times, if they work together, they revolt and people lose their power. And he's afraid of the crowd because it says the crowd was in love with John. And so what he does is he puts John in prison indefinitely. And so that's why John's there. But he's in prison while he's there. That is, we already read in verse 3, he asked Jesus this question, are you the one to come? He's asking, are you the guy? Again, I want to remind you, John grew up knowing of his miraculous birth, his calling to be the, the, the forerunner to the Christ, knowing that Jesus was a Lord. As his ministry began, he was proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand, the Messiah has come. There he is, the Lamb of God who is so holy, I'm not even fit to tie his sandals. I must decrease, he must increase. The point is, I want you to understand that John has all the right information and he believes it. Now I also want to point a point out a bit later in this passage, Jesus also lifts up John as awesome. We're going to skip to uh, verse 7. We'll come back to 4 in just a second, but look at verse 7. After this encounter, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd, and this is what Jesus says of John. What did you go out to the desert to see? Now, he's going to ask them some rhetorical questions that all the answers are, of course, no. The first question he asked them, did you go out to the desert to see a reed swayed by the wind? What does he mean by that? Did you go out to see some weak preacher who was vacillating here and there that had no idea what he was saying? No, of course that's not why you went out to see John. You went out to see someone who had a strong conviction, a powerful message. He goes on to say, if that's not why you didn't go out, what'd you go out to see, a man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see, a prophet? And then he answers the question, Yes. He tells them the answer. That's why you went out. You didn't go out and check John uh, out because he's you know, some fancy clothes wearing Nancy. No. You went out because he was different and he spoke a message with great strength and conviction. You went out, you all went out to him because you thought he was a prophet. No, you went out to him because you thought he was the prophet to come, the one you've been waiting for. Then Jesus gives him some inside information about John. He confirms their su suspicions. Going on in verse nine, he says, I tell you, he's more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it was written, and then Jesus quotes the Old Testament, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Jesus here quotes Old Testament prophecy, and in doing so, confirms two very important things. Number one, John is the forerunner. John is the predestined one by God who will come before the Messiah. The one I've already mentioned, Old Testament prophesied, it's actually quoting Jesus, is quoting straight from Malachi 3.1, 
And by the time Jesus rolled around, this was an accepted messianic prophecy. So it wasn't like out of left field. And he says, behold, Malachi says, behold, I'm gonna send you a messenger who will clear my way. Jesus is clearly saying to the crowd, John is that guy. Now skip 11, I'll come back to it, because he goes on to confirm it even more. Look at verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. Now, you can get lost in the language. He's just saying Malachi was the last one who spoke of God. Now there's been 400 years of silence. Nobody speaks for God as a prophet until John. John's the first agent of God to speak again. But in these 400 years of silence, forceful men is the word he uses, but religious leaders have taken hold of the kingdom in religiosity and legalism for their own selfish gain that it was never intended to be. But what's important is verse 14. Look what it says. And if you're willing to accept it, he, John the Baptist, is the Elijah who was to come. And then he says, he who has ears, let him hear. Jesus has already said John's that guy from the Old Testament. Now he doubles down and makes an assertion from the Old Testament that they would understood. Malachi 4, 5. The reason why this is significant, it's the last spoken word of God until 400 years of silence. So the last sentence in the Old Testament prophesies of John the Baptist. It says this. I will send you a prophet Elijah before the great and deadful day of the Lord. And Jesus in 14 says, John is that guy. The point is what Jesus is clearly saying is John is the forerunner, he's the Elijah, the kingdom has come, and what he's really saying is, therefore, I am that Messiah that you are waiting for. John's paving the way for me. Again, Matthew's writing to his fellow countrymen to prove to them that Jesus is the Old Testament Messiah, and you may get lost in all this, but this was incredibly important for the Jewish people. For us, I'll just say it this way. Jesus cannot be the Messiah if this isn't true. For then, the Old Testament prophecy has not been fulfilled in John, and therefore it has not been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's why this is so incredibly significant. Now with that said, there's uh, one more verse I wanna share with you before making kind of the overarching point. Matthew 11, 11. You can go back there. In the middle of this theological point, Jesus is making, he says this of John, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, which I think that's everyone, no matter what anybody says today, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. What makes John great? Twofold. The first thing that makes John great has nothing to do with John. It's the calling. It's the position. We've all been given a calling. I talk about shape a lot here. I'm not gonna preach it again right now other than to say you have been given a specific calling based on who God made you to be. It's not volunteerism. It's where you're to step in to make a difference for the kingdom of God that does incredible things in your life. But for John, I'll just say this. His was a bit different because he's the only one called to be the forerunner of the Christ. So the position that God gave him that John didn't deserve any more than Israel deserved to be the chosen nation or you and I deserve to be in the kingdom of God, but the position as the forerunner made him biblically great. But secondly, John did step into that role and lived a life of obedience, fulfilling his purpose in the name of the Lord. Again, there's a lot to learn here. But when you and I step into that calling, that shape of ours, and then serve, for that passage goes on to say John's the greatest, but then it goes on to say one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. So who's greatest in the kingdom? It's when you and I understand our role, our shape, and then we just serve people around of us in the name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Greatness comes from serving Jesus. Now the reason why I lay all that out is John is a special person. He knew he was the forerunner. He knew Jesus was the prophesied Christ. He had inside information, and yet he did not get distracted from that calling in any kind of way that at times I think we all do. You know, things of the world, money, power, work, family, his powerful position. He stayed focused in living an ascetic uh, life. He gave up the pleasures of the world to fulfill his calling, and yet with all that said, the greatest in the kingdom in this passage 
has a faith crisis. John doubts. I want to remind you, I read it already twice. This is the third time. Jesus, John says, are you the one? Or should we be looking for another? Why if John has all this knowledge, has done this great stuff, lived a life of service to our Lord, is called by Jesus the greatest amongst the kingdom, why did he doubt? To be honest, like all of us, even though we would never say it out loud, we all have a bit of prosperity gospel mentality. What do I mean by that? I'll tell you why John's asking, are you the one? He's done nothing but obey the Lord, even to the point of great sacrifice. He stood before Herod Antipas and called out, God's law is great. And what does John get for all these incredibly godly decisions? Prison. John got prison because he obeyed. He's in prison without any kind of trial of defense and definitely in front of this powerful, ruthless ruler. Why? Obeying the Lord. See, all of us, including John, have this unspoken belief that if I do what's right, if I follow God, if I read the Bible, if I go to church, if I keep my life on the straight and narrow, if I live as a disciple, then good things will happen. And if bad things happen to me, it must be because I've done something wrong, as, as if somehow God is your own personal rabbit's foot. Do good things, good things happen. Do bad things, bad things happen. And yet, that's not what the Bible teaches. Listen, sometimes bad things happen because there are natural consequences for disobedience to our Lord and Savior. Sometimes he disciplines. The Bible says that. You can not like it, but it doesn't mean it's not true. I would say the vast majority of difficult things that happen in our life are simply because we live in a fallen world. What he promises in those difficulties that he'll walk you through that difficulty, he'll use it for your good and Jesus' glory. And God does say we are blessed for obedience. But those blessings don't always come in the package we want. We want to define God's blessings for us. But see, John, from an eternal perspective, is being blessed because he's in prison for the Lord. His obedience gave him prison, and that prison experience that ends up leading to his death gives Jesus glory, acclaim, and the gospel is propelled. Paul says it's an honor to suffer for the gospel. The rewards in heaven are absolutely unimaginable. But although that's a challenge for all of us, not only to understand, but in the midst of suffering and brace, it's still really not my point. The point I want to make is I want this truth to just marinate in this place for a bit. I want this fact to be heard in your soul. John the Baptist, the greatest amongst us, because of his position given to him by the Lord, and quite frankly how he stepped obediently into the role that he was given, when a bad thing happened to him, he questioned his faith. I just want that to sit for a second. What about you? Are you in a similar place right now? Have you been there? Are you facing some kind of difficult circumstance and although you admit you're a sinner, we all would, we all say I'm not perfect, but there's something inside you're like, but come on, Lord. I'm trying to do everything right. You've pursued God, read scripture, served God, financially been obedient to the tithe, a sacrifice for the Lord, shared your faith, and yet amidst that all, boom, this, whatever it is, has happened. Prison is now your experience. Your prison might be an illness, a broken relationship, a divorce, a financial catastrophe, a layoff, I don't know, but you're asking Jesus, I'm doing everything I can for you, Lord, but here I am. Are you the one? Is this all real? The reason why I wanna lay that out is because we've all been there in some form or fashion. John was there. And I just, I just, I don't wanna take the time and give you some kind of fancy, contrived church answer with your struggle. I just wanna take a moment to say, if you're there right now, it's okay. And the reason why I think it's important to say that it's because a lot of times I think the church answer to that is, oh, just have more faith. But that doesn't necessarily fix the struggle that you're in. It's still real. And I think it's just important to acknowledge it's okay to be there. In fact, I would even argue it's from those moments as we trust him and grow through that we become stronger still. And I think we just need to allow people to be there as we work with them through those incredibly faith struggles 
But I love what Jesus says to him in, in his doubt, going back to four, go back to verse four. This is Jesus' response to John's doubt. He says this, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. I love the fact that Jesus' response to John is not, are you serious? With all the inside information I've given you, with the special position that I've, I've handed to you, you're doubting? I love the fact that Jesus doesn't do that. In fact, what he does is simply quote scripture. That passage he gives you right there really is a mashup of Isaiah 26, 35, 42, and 61 that together say, and John would know that you will know the Messiah has come when you see the blind see, the lame walk, lepers cured, deaf hear, and the dead are raised. Again, if you were with us, from January to Easter, we spent all, the, the, all those months walking through Matthew 8 and 9, and that's what these passages were all about, Jesus' miracles. And the miracles, yes, were a part of proving that he has power over everything, but part of the miracles was fulfill Old Testament prophecy. What did we see happen in Matthew 8 and 9? Blind saw, deaf heard, lame walked, lepers were cured, and he raised someone from the dead. What's the point? When you see these things happen, you will know the Messiah is amongst you. And when John heard that, that's what he needed. He needed that in that moment. What does that mean for us? The point is, in our times of struggle, time of doubt, when we're like, Lord, seriously, I'm doing everything I can, Jesus says to you, I know you're in this prison, and you may not feel like it's part of the plan, you may feel like I'm silent, or I don't care, or or I may not be the one, but remember previously all I've done in your life for even now in your prison, I am at work. At Easter, we had a lot of videos that have these great stories of transformation and trust, but one of them uh, talked about they had this jar and they filled it with Ebenezer stones. And I'm not gonna take the time to unpack what Ebenezer means in our Bible, other than to just say, what they were doing was, is every time they knew God stepped into their life and did something special, they write it down on one of those stones and they put it into this large jar. Why? Why in the Old Testament does God regularly have them build an altar and lay down a pile of rocks in the middle of nowhere after a great event in which God showed up and did the miraculous? I'll tell you why. Because all of us as human beings so quickly forget in the midst of a new challenge how faithful God has been in our past. It's so easy for all of us in the midst of a new suffering to forget how faithful God has been in our past. If that's you today, the passage ends. I'm gonna just paraphrase what Jesus says. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but what he essentially says at the passage ends, he says, don't act like little kids who make assertions and deductions without looking at the facts. Look at verse 19. He ends by saying, but wisdom is proved right by our actions. Another way to say that is, Truth is proved right by actions, or we might say proof is in the pudding. Which means, in the midst of your prison, I'm sure you're hearing a lot of thoughts, you know, whispers that aren't true. You're not good enough, God doesn't care, he isn't real, and so in the midst of that uncertainty, we are to trust the word of God, and then the actions, the deeds, the things that God has faithfully done in your past. Because truth is proved right by his faithfulness in your past. One person says it this way. In our present, when we face struggles in our present, we need to be constantly reminded of God's faithfulness in our past so that we can move into the future with courageous faith. In the present, remember his faithfulness in your past so that you can move courageously with faith into the future because I believe he will do it again. And so I'm challenging everyone, especially if you're in a prison at this time. God, I'm doing everything right, but this, where are you? Are you the one? I challenge you sometime this afternoon to just take a note card and pick one thing, one moment you know God showed up in your past. Just one, and write it down on that card. Put it on your refrigerator, put it on your, your, your computer screen, put it on your mirror, put it on your dashboard, where you're gonna see it the most and be reminded of God's faithfulness in your past. For I believe he will be faithful in your future and he will do it again. Let's pray. God, thank you for this story because I think it just makes it real that 
A guy like John, the greatest in the kingdom, who had all the inside information and yet in the midst of difficulty said, are you the one? Someone needs to hear today. I know someone here needs to hear. It's okay to be there. It's part of the process of trusting you and growing in our faith. And as we walk through that doubt, we become stronger still. I pray for each one of them, every person in this room, that they can, that you would specifically whisper into their, their, their souls that moment of faithfulness in their past so they can hold on to it in their future. Bless that person right now who's in the middle of a prison. I pray that you'd meet them in that struggle. Become real. And Lord, your blessings don't always come in the packages we want, but you bless. And so I pray for that person in their prison that you would walk them through it and you would be glorified. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said.